Hello. Today, I am in the southeast corner of Arizona. I'm about 90 to 100 miles southeast of Tucson, Arizona, and I am going to visit uh, Fort Bowie National Monument. Uh, Fort Bowie was a uh, integral part of the development of this area with uh, the Apache Wars. The fort was actually, be they began building it July 28, 1862. Now that's about all I know about the fort at this point. I'm off to get started. It's about 6 a.m. in the morning and I'm going to take a, an interpretive trail. It's a mile and a half long and I'm anxious to take it and see what it has to offer. So come join me as I travel the one and a half mile trail to the visitor center. The Spanish called it the Pass of Chance. They might have named it the Pass of Death for violence that swirled around it. Because its springs were an unfailing water source, Apache Pass, separating two mountain ranges, drew a possession of immigrants, prospectors, and soldiers to this Apache homeland. It was also the scene of two engagements with Cochise's Apache warriors, the Baskin Affair of 1861 and the Battle of Apache Pass, July 15th to the 16th, 1862, in which a Union army under Brigadier General James Carleton was ambushed en route to confront Confederate troops in Arizona and New Mexico. After their final surrender in September 1886, Geronimo and his remaining followers were brought to Fort Bowie, assembled on the parade ground and taken by wagons to the railroad for the long journey to exile in Florida. Geronimo's defeat ended both the Apache Wars and the Fort Bowie's military usefulness. The fort was an active post for eight more years, finally closing on October 17, 1894, when the last troops were withdrawn. Park Campsite In March 1854, Lieutenant John Park of the Tropographical Engineering Corps led a survey party in search of an all-weather route from the Transcontinental Railroad. The Battle of Apache Pass, July 15th, July 16th, 1862. An advance guard of 96 California volunteers marching towards the San Simeon River to establish a supply depot for the California Column followed the Butterfield Road through Apache Pass. As they approached the abandoned stage station, Cochise and his ally, Coloradus, with a combined force of 140 to 160 warriors, ambushed the rear of the column. The Californians countermarched from the station, driving the Apaches into the hills, only to find they had taken up new positions around the spring. The Californians attacked again and finally reached the water after dispersing the Apaches from rock fortifications commanding both flanks of Apache Springs. This battle led directly to the establishment of Fort Bowie. Sergeant Albert Fontaine chronicled the event. He said in his journal, The situation was by no means an inevitable one. Men and officers were worn out with fatigue, but water we must have, and to attain it we must force the enemy's almost impregnable position, garrisoned with the bravest warriors of the combined Apache tribes. Our line dashed forward and advanced under a continuous and galling fire from both sides of the cannon until we reached a point within 50 yards of the spring. Then, from the rocks and willows above the spring, came a sheet of flame. I ordered the men to fix bayonets and make one dash for the summit, and the next moment we were over a rough stone wall and on the inside of a circular fortification some 30 feet in diameter. Fifty more or more Indians were going out and down the hill on the opposite side. As we carried the hill, a cheer came up from down below. As our comrades dashed to the spring, with camp kettles and canteens. Fire was opened upon, then from the opposite hill. But we turned a plunging fire upon the enemy, and they were soon in full flight. 
the howitzers were brought into action, and from our elevated position, we could see hundreds of Indians scampering to the hills to escape the bursting shells. This is a ruin that was the home of Jesse L. Missap, 1863 to 1929, a local prospector and well digger. For years, this structure had been unidentified until a park visitor said that as a boy, he rode with his dad in a Model T Ford to visit his uncle at this cabin. Millsap perished when a dy dynamite charge exploded below him while digging a well. He is interred in the Bowie Cemetery. story. U.S. Indian agent Thomas Jeffords governed some 900 Apaches here in 1875 to 1876 under the vigilance of the U.S. Army at Fort Bowie. Cochise, a friend of Jeffords, died in 1874, leaving a band divided in leadership and conduct. Some Apaches lingered on the reservation while others shipped away to plunder Mexican settlements. In June 1876, the government removed Jeffords and moved 325 Apaches northward to the San Carlos Reservation. However, many escaped and fled to distant sanctuaries to renew hostilities for another decade. The building. In 1984, archeologists excavated these remains of the late 19th century adobe building, most notably the Jefferson Agency. The building had fireplaces for each of the three rooms and wooden flooring. Bits of adobe, plaster, and whitewashed wood were found inside. The rock shells in front of the building suggest a porch. Typical buildings for the period had flat roofs covered with brush and earth. The small windows with deep sills a likely corral behind the building, penned agency stock. The slow we weathering of the newly exposed walls, they've been stabilized with the Toby Pastor. This is a typical camp setup. 
typically the, uh, the Apaches would live in groups. And usually there were many more than just one. living quarters. During the plant harvest, aguave and mezcal provided the primary food staple. The crowns were gathered ceremonially, roasted in large pit ovens, then eaten fresh or dried for later use. An Apache hunter chose the straight stalk of a sotol for his lance. The strong bow was fashioned from a branch of a mulberry tree. The sinew of a deer's leg formed the bow, bowstring, and a light reed provided the arrow. Deer was the principal game animal. Pronghorn, mountain lion, wood rat, squirrel, and rabbit were also hunted. Pottery fragments from around Apache Spring suggested it was used by prehistoric Indians before the Apache arrived. Journals of early Spanish explorers described Apache trails radiating from the spring. The Butterfield Trail was constructed through Apache Pass simply to take advantage of the precious spring of water. Disputes over the spring water caused a raging conflict between Cochise and California volunteers over a century ago. Without Apache Springs, there might not have been a stage station or a Fort Bowie. Apache Springs provided water for the first Fort Bowie located not too far from here. Let's take a look at the Potter Magazine. This was about 1890. Has been restored as close to original as possible through dedicated volunteers and National Park employees. This was a gun shed for the artillery dating back to 1890. In the visitor center at Fort Bowie, lots of interesting information here. It's very well laid out. And the nice thing is, on these hot days, is air conditioned, uh, which is really nice. And so it's got a lot of the history about the, the Apache Indians and their history in the area. The history of how the, when the European settlers and the Spaniards came, the telegraph came, a lot of actual photos of many of the uh, different natives that lived here, Apaches. And then we have Rho Geronimo, one of the best Indian generals to ever fight against the U.S. Army lasted for two decades before he finally surrendered. And of course, like any other good museum, they have their gift shop. Then they have, this is the parade rest uniform for dress parades. Women of the Apache Wells, they kept a good household. 
some of the firearms used by the cavalry in this area. And then the California column, their official dress. Looks pretty hot to me. Definitely worth the mile and a half walk. Let's spend a little bit of time here at New Fort Bowie. By the way, this area is handicap accessible. I walked in on the mile and a half trail from one parking lot. There's another road that comes off the main road sooner that you would take up to come right up to the visitor center. So it is handicap accessible. You don't have to necessarily come in on the mile and a half walk that I did. This happens to be the quartermaster storehouse here, or what's left of it. Infantry barracks. Enlisted infantrymen found that privacy was not a feature of barracks life. Privates and corporals bunked together in the main room. Sergeants occupied small adjoining rooms. Each soldier stored his military gear and personal belongings on a wooden shelf above his cot and in a wooden locker at its foot. Hence the term foot locker. Remains with a little bit of upkeep in an attempt to keep it still visible. This is the mess hall. Behind you can see where the main kitchen area was. I'm sure the yucca plant wasn't there. The schoolhouse. Military regulations required every post to have a school taught by a qualified enlisted man. As the teacher, they would get an additional 35 cents per day, although they still had their regular duties to do as well, including guard duty. The remains of the sutler store. The sutler store was just very similar. Well, it was the, really the first uh, PX as we uh, know of them today. And originally, the before 1867, when the uh, military tightened things up, the sutlers, the people that ran them, uh, were they weren't quite the honest types of folks. The uh, quartermaster that was here that ran this store was one of the more new breeds. Uh, he was considered to be honest and have fair prices. The Sutler stores are just like your PX's today. They sell fruits, vegetables, clothing, all kinds of stuff that the regular army did not supply or supplied not enough of. This back area here was the corral where the horses would be kept. The, so the uh, military officers had one bar where they had whiskey and it was a little bit more comfortable and then the enlisted personnel had another bar that served beer i kind of wonder i kind of doubt it was cold beer it was probably a little bit warm and so this is the forerunner of today's px's These are some of the remains of Officer's Row or Officer's Quarters. And the existing walls are covered with protective adobe and plaster to preserve them. According to regulations, rank and seniority determine the number of rooms, stoves, amount of firewood an officer was allowed. A married officer's family shared his allowance. Let's take a look up here. See what they got? But this area here was Officer's Row. The houses weren't really big, but they were a lot better than staying in the barracks. Rank has its privileges. Commanding Officer's Quarters. The fort's most elaborate structure was a two-story Victorian-style mansion. It was built between 1884 and 1885 for about $4,000. An expensive home at the time. Among its 13 rooms, 
originally designed as a duplex, were a drawing room, a sewing room with a skylight, a dining room, seven, seven bedrooms. The exterior included two verandas and two wings covered with fancy shingles in bands of alternating colors. Post Commander Major Eugene Beaumont, the home's first occupant, complained, the large amount of useless and unnecessary orient ornamentation has been at great expense and a waste of time and money. Such a plan has, should never have been designed to make work for the carpenters. But the waste was not total. Beaumont gave away two of his daughters in marriage to Fort Bowie's officers in this house. Hospital and Stewart's Quarters. Built in 1889. They were actually adobe buildings at the time and very very well built. Had good uh, circulation, air circulation. They worked hard to keep a good healthy environment for the soldiers and it was probably one of the more extensive buildings on the ground. Quite an impressive structure. The center part there that you see is the area where they probably had their cots and some of some of their uh, did some of their work. Had a couple of wood floor in it. Very up to date as or as up to date as possible. The building had 12 rooms in it. So it was quite, quite a nice facility for its time. This massive adobe structure was one of the earliest structures built at the fort back in the early 1880s. This is the cavalry barracks where all the cavalry stayed. Inside of this building housed the cavalry members, the infantry, the enlisted people, it had a uh, kitchen, mess hall, library, and everything that the soldiers would need to survive on. And so this was a very well used building. And its height, it had a great roof, pitched roof, air flowed through it so that it was rather cool on the inside and gave the soldiers as much comfort as possible. When Fort Bowie was constructed, water was pumped from Bear Canyon Spring to this double reservoir excavated out of solid rock. In 1887, actually an ice machine was brought here, which enabled the fort to have ice, which was quite a deal back then. And it really was a real boost for the morale because now they could keep fresh food, they could keep meats, they could keep uh, their beer cold. Remember earlier in the Sutter's office, I talked about how their beer may not be cold, but look at this, this still has liquid on the inside, which is water, it's not oil. And so this was the heart and soul what really made this fort cook. I'm glad you stayed with me through the whole video. I uh, have just returned to the parking lot it took me, I left at 6 a.m. in the morning, and uh, it is now just about 10 o'clock in, in the morning. So 6 to 10, about four hours. The uh, trail that I took was a mile and a half. I had uh, many stops, as you could see, as you have seen already. And uh, so it took me a while to get up there, up to the ranger station, then tour the old fort area, take some photos and some movies up there. And then on the way back, it only took me about 20, between 20 and 25 minutes to get back to walk a mile and a half over the trail. So I was pretty pleased with that. This uh, park is, uh, I'll tell you, I have, this is the uh, furthest I have had to hike to a visitor center. It was a mile and a half. Now, I didn't have to do that. If you're someone that is not mobile, that uh, in your particular part of life right now, you can't do a mile and a half over rough terrain, there is a road that you can take that will take you to the visitor center. 
when you're coming in from Bowie towards the uh, Fort Bowie, you'll come to one turnoff for the Fort Bowie Museum and um, National Monument. You'll want to take that road. It is a dirt road. It's a uh, I can't say how well it is, but judging by the roads that I drove on to get here where I'm at, it's a good road. And of course, uh, there's a friendly ranger there. She was there to answer all the questions. The visitor center was nice. It had a great big veranda, and it was great to sit on the rockers a little bit and just kind of chill out. So that was really great. When uh, you do walk here, you do need to be aware of your surroundings and uh, particularly underfoot you need to this is rattlesnake country i saw no rattlesnakes uh, I, I when i walk i watch for them i've lived in numerous places where rattlesnakes prevail and i saw none none at all i saw a lot of lizards a lot of ants but that was about it as far as wildlife so should you come to uh fort bowie I think you should. It's a it's an interesting type of a visitor center. It's different than the rest. Uh, you, with the hike, it's a very good uh, mile and a half interpretive trail. I did not record all the stuff that's there. I was a little bit more selective. So come, enjoy, spend some time. There was another trail that I did not take because there's some other things I want to do today. So thanks for tuning in, and may all your seas be calm. Take care. Thanks for watching and uh, take a little bit of time and check out my other videos on my YouTube page. Take care. May all your seas be calm.